Hello and welcome to the special bonus episode of The Dairy Edge. Chagas are running a weekly Let's Talk Dairy webinar series, which is also being made available as a podcast. On this week's webinar, tillage specialist Kieran Collins joined Stuart Childs to explain the importance of integrated pest management on grassland farms and control of weeds in clover swords. Okay, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to, the, to today's webinar. To, today, uh, we're following up on the piece that we did with Deirdre uh, Hennessy two weeks ago in relation to clover. Obviously, as we said on the day, clover is going to be a very important part of future dairy farming systems in Ireland. Um, but obviously, it has its challenges around weed control and so forth. So there aren't too many of us in the dairy side of the house that have the, the level of knowledge that Kieran is going to deliver to you know in terms of uh, sprays and the control of weeds within clover and the, I suppose there's obviously been a lot of tension around the whole on one side of the department they're saying we have to put in clover and on the other side the sprays were removed from it. Now, uh, I suppose the department have probably got the blame there slightly in the wrong and so Kieran's going to give us a bit of a background to that scenario um, and he's also going to talk about what's called inter- IPM or integrated pest management as well. So that's a very important part I suppose people probably dismiss it a lot as being a more a tillage element of um, farming, but it's uh, an important part of grassland as well. And I'm involved with Kieran actually in, in doing a course on a sustainable use directive, we'd say, which relates to pesticides during the course of most years. We haven't done it now with the last 12 months over COVID, but it's just making better decisions around uh, soil fertility and making sure that uh, grassland establishes well when you do reseed so that when you do use your post emergence, you're limiting the amount of spray and so forth. And like spray is the last step in that in that journey really, Kieran, isn't it? And that's kind of the angle that you're coming from. So look, as I said, Kieran is uh, just to give him his proper um, in- introduction, is a tillage specialist for the south of the country, um, covering most of Cork, Kerry, Limerick, kind of anywhere where there's tillage in the south of the country, Kieran is covering it. Very knowledgeable in the area. And as I said, he's going to talk to us today about the whole integrated pest management background as to why the clover spray- safe sprays were taken away there's a derogation which is going to kick in in uh, tomorrow week, I think it is, from the 14th. And, and it's only going to be there for four months. So Kieran is going to give us uh, some of the, the reasoning for behind that and so forth as well. So I'll hand over to you, Kieran. You're going to share and I'll encourage people to ask questions as we go along because uh, Kieran has, is very good in terms of the knowledge that he's ha- he has here. And he, it, it'll be a great opportunity to pick up um, some pointers in relation to spray management and just the whole general management of weed control in, in grassland as well. As Stuart said, um, Kieran Collins, my, my own name, I'm a crop specialist based, based in the south. So look, my, my background is all crops really, um, but I do a little bit on the, obviously the herbicide bit there as, as Stuart described. So um, three, sec- five sections of my presentation, IPM, pesticides and water, you're all familiar with those. I just look, there's a lot of reminders in there and I'll, I'll just emphasize the importance to 24 dB is obviously the big one for today. I talk about the herbicides that are available for new lays and then pests as well, because that often is, is an issue as well. So look, IPM, um, integrated pest management, it's mandatory, okay? That's just something very important for us all, whether you're a farmer, an advisor, uh, involved in the distribution of, of, of chemicals, it's mandatory for everybody. We all have a role to play in it. Um, sorry, I'm gonna have to try and do this if, if you can still see me. We all have, we all have a role to play. OK, um, and, and I suppose some people would say, well, look, you know, cut to the chase. I need to know what chemical I need to spray in my reseeds or to control my docks or that. But we do have a smaller pool of products available, none more so than the 2,4-DB that we're going to talk about later on. You know, who knows what's going to happen with glyphosate or any of those products down the road. If there's any, I doubt there's any horticulture people on today, but, you know, if you go back 10, 15 years ago in horticulture, you had a broad suite of products available for controlling disease and pests in, in horticulture crops. Today, you have very, very little. They're minority crops. The cost of registration and re- registration of a new product is so expensive that it's not financially viable at times for, for companies to do that. So, you know, um, we just have to mind what we have, I suppose, and that's where the bit about the water comes in. But also be aware of IPM and only use the chemicals where, where we absolutely need to. So, look, in, in, by way of definition, IPM is biological, physical, and other non-chemical controls that you prefer all of those before, before you, um, you know, before you, you reach for the spray cabinet. So, and another thing just to keep in mind as well is the whole farm to fork area as well. Um, 
you know, it's about, you know, everybody's familiar with it and there's a number of areas in it. Like, but one of the targets in there is to reduce the, the chemicals uh, that we use or the pesticides that we use at the moment by 50%. So that's just something to keep in the back of your mind. People will be aware, obviously, in the fertilizer end of it as well, 20% reduction target there. And obviously that, you know, completes that loop that, that Stuart was talking about where, you know, clover and corporation and grassland is just so, so important. Um, so IPM, look, I've said this already, it applies to all professional users. So professional users is, 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 is all, all farmers, okay? Um, and look, the basic principles of IPM without, you know, go, spending too long on it, prevention and or suppression, you know, um, monitoring, um, application of appropriate plant protection measure. So like I, I've, I've uh, in the next slide, I've got a pyramid, but it's like that you do everything possible to prevent the pests. So the pest can be a dock in your grassland, it can be a leather jacket in your reseed, it could be a disease in your barley. So you do all the measures that you can, you know, the cultural control, the physical, all of those before you reach for, for, for the pesticide cabinet. But also within using pesticides, there's a lot of IPM measures we can use. So we only use, you know, because the max rate of something is two liters per hectare, that doesn't mean that we have to use two liters per hectare. You know, it's judging the rate to the, to the size of the weed or the pest, the disease, assessing the risk. And it's also then about doing things properly, like, you know, that, you know, you abide by buffer zones, you know, weather conditions, you know, ground conditions, all of those things, they're all part of it. And the final bit is recording. And sometimes we maybe forget about that. We think it's a cross compliance. We write down what we did and that is very important and is part of the sustainable use directive. But it's also, if I apply a herbicide on my, on my grassland reseeds, you know, it's coming back a few weeks later. What, did it work and you know if it didn't why didn't it work and, and and doing all those assessments as well okay so that's the ipm triangle and as i said you look you do all the things the the cultural controls the physical biological and finally the, the chemical is at the end so i suppose the way the way that i kind of do it is it's it's a it's a it's a process of decisions and actions okay so you make a decision to do something and then there's an action there um, after making that decision and there's consequences to that action. So again, just to maybe in a grassland context, I've sort of re, re, rejigged the, the pyramid here. So prevention, you know, examples there, you know, obviously limiting poaching, uh, rotating silage and grass ground, as we know, constantly cutting silage, you get more of an open sward, more of an opportunity for for weeds. We can all see it at the moment. I was driving around the countryside yesterday and you'd be amazed by the amount of chickweed around. And I, I presume that's a consequence of maybe slightly slower growth this spring. You know, it is, it is allowed, you know, where there was weeds there, allow, allowed them to come through. Suppression, you know, it's a competitive sward. And in a grassland context, that's one, two, and three. It's having a competitive sward. And that's why when you spray a reseed, you spray your docks, you get your competitive sward. You won't see docks for four or five years if you've got a good competitive sward. So, and obviously linked to that is soil fertility. So they're all key aspects, I suppose, at the bottom of the pyramid. And then you have your decision-making pro process then. You know, I've got weeds in my, in my field. Do I reseed? You know, or maybe can I do something like topping or, you know, is physically, I suppose, can I pull weeds like maybe ragwort at times, stuff like that, you know, so then that's the decision making process. And then maybe you have to bring in thresholds as well. Like what's the what's the population of, of weeds in this field, you know, per you know, per unit area, say per meter squared, like, and is that impacting significantly on grass production? Do I have to have a completely green field, absolutely weed free? What's the threshold? And can I manage a smaller amount of weeds? And then eventually you might say, okay, you know, I have to, I have to, to do something about this from a chemical perspective. And then it's about selecting the right, um, about selecting the right product, the right rate. Then it's about applying it, as I said earlier on, and then the final bit is the evaluation that we come back, look at it, what, what worked, what didn't work, what am I going to do differently the next time? Okay, so maybe that's just Stuart, the IPM pyramid in a bit of a, maybe in a grassland context where, um, you know, where you can apply those different measures to the different I layers. I suppose, Kieran, as well, just um, you said there about the kind of the thresholds that you're willing to tolerate, yeah. like, and obviously that's going to vary from weed to weed as well then. 
and you're kind of saying maybe for example you could have three or four different weeds in a sward but they mightn't be all that serious now docks obviously are are a challenge i suppose and maybe if they're dominating and you do decide to spray for them then there's obviously the benefit that you're going to impact on the other, other species as well as long as you pick the right chemical so there's almost a decision requirement there as well that what you do decide to use if you do use it that it's actually effective across the spectrum of weeds that you do have identified in the fields as well as not. I, I think so Stuart and, and like a, a good example there is and I often get called out to maybe a reseed where there would be annual weeds there mm. you know something like brassica weeds would be a typical one now or, or maybe red chink or something like that yeah. so you know if they're the only weeds there you know i you know you could go in if you can graze it or if you sometimes if they're bad you might need to, to go in and top it or cut it which might be ideal in some situations but you know i suppose there are non-chemical ways of controlling some weeds and i suppose it's knowing your weed you know is it an annual is it a perennial you know and and as you're you, you're right like and there's some weeds like docks I suppose chickweed, they, they would be two examples of ones that you, you know, you probably will have to go to the spray cabinet at some stage there, all right. Yeah, Yeah, I suppose chickweed can be a bit funny in, in uh, reseeds, like just depending on when, when you get a, get a chance to get at it. I suppose with the post-emergency, it can actually dominate a sward very quickly, but it can. Like, grazing can deal with it a lot of the time. But if it just gets out of hand, it actually can have a serious impact on the, on the reseed, can't it? On, on the establishment, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And that, that kind of goes for any of the annual weeds, like in the sense that, you know, no, I might be saying here, well, look, this isn't a problem because I can cut it or graze it. But like if it's if the numbers are high enough, you know, it's going to suppress the sward and your reseed isn't going to establish properly. So again, I suppose back to the pyramid, you know, yeah. decisions and actions, you know. Okay. So, okay. So my second part is 205 is pesticides and water. So again, I'm sure everybody has heard an awful lot about this. So I'll just go through some of the some of the main issues there. So I pulled this up from a pesticide usage survey that was done. It was the last one that was done in, in 2017. So these are the 10 um, top 10 active ingredients that are most extensively used on permanent pasture. So the, the, the reseeds wouldn't be in this, okay? So these are ranked by, by weight, so it's kilograms of active. So if we looked at maybe this in a different way, it's in the report, maybe per hectare, it, it, it would alter the table, but MCP will always be at the top of it, whether it's kgs of active or whether it's area treated. Uh, it's one of it's 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 the most widely used um, herbicide in, in 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 on grassland in Ireland. Okay, glyphosate is one that would fall down uh, the table if you were looking at maybe on a per hectare basis. But like you know, you're putting out maybe four to five liters, up to six liters of 360 grams of active. So that's, that brings it back up the table there. But it is, I think it is important to know, look where, which are the ones that are most widely used. So it's no surprise, MCPA, um, glyphosate, 2,4-D is obviously a big one. And then you have a big tail off then, you know, in, in, into some of the others that would be, that would make up parts of products really. Yeah, and I suppose it might just, um, we said they're very common to you, but uh, like I've been saying to you before, I suppose but the, the grassland side of the house, the, the chemical actually isn't the thing that comes to, near, to the mind first, I suppose. And I suppose ideally we probably shouldn't use trade names, but just to... Yeah, sorry, like, no, yeah, Life say it is your roundup, like... Um, it's round your up, yeah. 24D and your 24DB would say just maybe give a couple of trade names that people yeah, might yeah, recognize. Yeah, absolutely. So, so D50, I suppose, would be 24D, would be would be one of the common ones. Um, I'm just trying to think of another one off the top of my head now. It's not coming to me, but MCPA would be M50. There would be, I suppose, yeah, most people would be familiar with MCPA, MCPA in some, yeah. some shape or form. Uh, yeah. Trifluor wouldn't be used uh, on its own. It's generally in a mix with fluoxypyr. So fluoxypyr would be something the straight would be hurler, but it would be in a lot of the the reseed ones there. Uh, so Pastor the Trio, Pastor uh, Trio, Dock Star, yep. those ones, you know. The 2,4-DB is the one that, that we'll be talking about in the minute. So that's like Clover Max, Legamix DB. Um, it would have been sold as a straight as Imbuton. Um, yeah. So that would be then the maker prop P is gone now. That would have been CMPP of old Duplicis and say yeah. so that, that that's gone since seventeen or well gone in Grassland. Yeah. Uh, Pyrolid would be again. It would be Dow Shield uh, on its own, but it would be in in Pastor Trio those those type products. I mean, a Pyrolid would be one that's in forefront. 
Okay, just to give people an idea, but I'll, 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 I'll talk. I have a, a slide at the end with the products in it and I might maybe just, uh, just go through it a little bit more then as well as short. Okay. So I suppose, look, and, and I don't want to be, you know, kind of uh, dramatic as such, but like, you know, I spoke about the heart lads earlier on and, and certainly in my industry in tillage, we've had um, a couple of big actives gone in, in recent years that we would have been widely used, like the likes of Chlortalinol and Bravo and stuff like that. So I suppose, look, we just have to be mindful that we have to mind the chemistry that we have. You know, if MCPA keeps turning up in water, look, it'll, it'll, it'll have to be restricted or, you know, or, or maybe worse. So, I mean, we just really, really need to mind the, the pesticides that we have, you know, and nobody wants to be to have a, a situation like that picture. So look, the ones that are most commonly found in water, there's, there's four of them. This was from the EPA survey, Giant Position Paper on Pesticides in 2019. So MCPA is obviously the big one, 75% uh, of all exceedances. And look, there's reasons for that. As, as you saw in the previous slide, it's widely used number one, but it's highly soluble. Okay, so you're going to, you're, you're getting surface water contamination, um, you know, literally straight runoff or also from, from spray drift as well. But you also, because it's so soluble, you, you get groundwater um, leaching as well. And I suppose where you think of MCPA, I suppose its primary use is in, is in, is in for the control of roaches oh, and that. Uh -huh. So, you know, that's, that's obviously going to be the, the, the wetter ground. So like if we think of back to our IPM and link this up with, with pesticides and water, you know, there's a massive cultural control area around rushes. You know, it's drainage, it's soil fertility, it's reseeding the competitive sward, all of those things, rather than running out with MCPA once a year, you know, because that's inevitably, and it's, 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 it's obviously there in front of us, it's appearing in the, in the water the whole time. So, you know, there, there's a massive IPM piece that, that needs to be done around MCPA. The make a prop, as I say, is gone at this stage. Uh, the 2,4-D would also obviously be, be, be quite widely used there as well. And clopyrolid shows up as well. Now, clopyrolid would be in Pastor Trio. Um, now, that would also be used in, in, in tillage crops as well. It's due to, it's again, a little bit like MCPA in, in terms of its solubility and that. And there are restrictions in terms of updates uh, when you can use that at the end of the year as well. So um, look, uh, just to, to, to kind of wrap up the, the, the pesticides and water, but it's just to be aware of buffer zones, okay? That is the crucial thing, you know? I spoke about the soil conditions. You know, you obviously don't spray when there's, there's surface water. You need good, good ground conditions. Obviously, you don't, you don't spray in adverse weather conditions, but a crucial one is, is buffer zones, and we need to be mindful there. So. I, I, I took that photo when there was a bit of sun shining, so I'm not sure how, how visual it is, but the, the outside stake there is five meters from the top of the bank. So that stake there, I would regard as the top of the bank. So every product has a buffer zone. It can be one meter out to, we've got a, a new um, fungicide this year that's got a 30 meter buffer zone, okay? So the stake is the top of the bank, uh, anywhere where there's water, uh, where wa any, 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 body, any water carrying body, you measure from the top of the bank and you move out, whether it's one, two, five, 30 meters. And that is your buffer zone. You do not go inside that with a standard flat fan nozzle. Okay. So, the Kieran, you're saying there that uh, we said the stake is back to one and a half meters from the top of the bank and your buffer is from the stake. And so in, in reality, yeah. you're, you're even further back than your buffer is really almost. Well, there. yeah, you, you, the, the, the measurement for this is the top of the bank. And I suppose yeah. that, that is important. And it can be hard to define now. You know, yeah. I suppose, you know, sometimes the river might be easier. Like I, I use the stake there, I suppose, if that if that, that drain was to overflow there, I'd imagine somewhere around the stake is kind of where, where that would start to happen, like, you yeah. know. And I suppose, um, it's it, like, I know we've, we've done, as I said to there yesterday, we've done a bit of work on this in relation to the slurry in particular there and how the five meter buffer actually doesn't come into play until two weeks after the close period and two weeks before the close period, we'll say that there, it's actually a 10 meter buffer for slurry. Uh, for those two weeks either side of the close period as well. I think that's actually, we haven't done that now, that's a very visual element and it comes across quite well. And the two meters is even for the fertilizer as well. I think hmm. I, I think we're, we're kind of, we've been paying lip service to the whole uh, buffer zone probably with a good while, but we, we need, people need to be very conscious of it uh, into the future across fertilizer sprays and, uh, and slurry obviously as well. 
Yeah. And then we'll say fertilizer standard two meters. The slurry is a standard five meters, we'll say outside of that two week window around the clause period. But the spray is depending on the spray, it's going to vary. Like, and it and will then, vary. Then you yeah. Join, yeah, you're trying your nozzle scenario then as well. And there could be more variation in it. So people need to be very conscious of it when it comes to the sprays in particular. Yeah, yeah. And like if, if you're not sure, there's, the, and I have a, a, a snip from the website there. Um, I'll, 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 I'll just go to that first and I'll go back to the nozzles then. So every, every if you go into the, the department website under SUD, there's, there's a, what's called Stripe. It's a surface water tool for reducing the impact of pesticides on the environment. And all the commonly used herbicides will be on that list. Now, it was last updated in March 2020. So maybe if there's something after that, that might be missing. But look, there's just three examples there of widely used, um, you know, grassland herbicides. So you've M M50, which is the MCPA, has got a five meter buffer zone. Clover Max, which we'll be talking about in a minute, has got a one meter buffer zone. And then the, um, the, that 24 d trichlor combination there has got a 10 meter buffer zone. Now, I suppose I don't want to make it overly complicated. They are the buffer zones using what's known as a standard flat fan nozzle. If my, my thing will, will go back here for me. So that's a standard flat fan nozzle, which will be on I will say every sprayer, but certainly the vast, vast majority of sprayers. So a standard flat fan nozzle gives you, um, you know, I suppose small droplets um, and they would be the standard, but you can use what's called an air induction nozzle. So what an air induction nozzle is, is that there is air incorporated into the nozzle as the, the spray is coming out with the effect of creating larger droplets. Now they're coarser, and larger, and I won't get into the, the whole area around spray, uh, spray technology in terms of coverage and that, but they do have less drift, and that is the key thing. So what the implication of that is, is if I have uh, drift reducing nozzles, I can reduce that buffer zone down to, we'll say it's 10 meters there on the label, I can reduce it down to, you know, one meter there if I've, if I've got a 75% drift reducing, drift reducing nozzle there, okay. And I suppose, um, Kieran, is, now, it, is, it some, is it something that, uh, we we'll say dairy farmers maybe that are using, are doing their own spraying need to consider, or, you know, given that, we we'll say, Clovermax there is already at one meter without the stripe anyway, so do you need to get overly concerned or, yeah. and, and, and I suppose the second question then, is it just a matter of unscrewing the, the flex fan and, and replacing it with the air induction or is there more to do to the sprayer? Okay, Mo no, Mo most nozzle holders will hold or will hold up to four nozzles. So it's just twist it and, and you get the, 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 the new set of nozzles or the different type. I suppose from a tillage context, I suppose it, it really is about the, there's a couple of kind of scenarios really where you're spraying a lot and you have a lot of water courses maybe and you are using a lot of products with wide, bu wide buffer zones I think they're a necessity you know um if you can you know if you're just using clover max every year for argument's sake or glyphosate which has got a roundup which has got a one meter buffer zone it's you probably don't have that that same requirement but to be to be at the same time, using low drift nozzles, they are very effective and they do reduce drift as well, you know, so it, it does open up the opportunities for maybe, you know, spraying days as well. So I think it's horses for courses. If somebody has a lot of water courses on their land, you know, they're using products that, you know, have a, have a decent buffer zone, say from five meters out, you know, there's certainly something, something to consider. Um, you know, I suppose that's the way I'd answer it, uh, Stuart, really. Yeah, and then I suppose the other thing, Kieran, I suppose just to allay any concerns, I suppose, the, the one metre buffer zone is there to avoid the drift. So, like, just because you keep out a metre doesn't mean that you're not going to get effective weed control in that one metre strip to the wire either, doesn't it? Yeah, well, you, 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 you nozzle, obviously, the, you, you get coverage from the nozzle, it's angled, um, yeah. you know, but yeah, look, I, you, you will have an unsprayed strip, um, you know, from that one metre or five metres or 10 metres in, that's, that's the way it will work, like, you know, yeah. but look, it's to protect water, and that's the yeah. ultimate goal here, like, to protect water, you know, if the, the, the product, you know, say the, the M50 there, it's five metres, so, you know, that's that there is a reason for that five meters we'll say you know and then low drift nozzles obviously reduce the drift so that that does reduce that buffer zone then if you, if you are using them you know yeah very good
So, um, so section number three is short, but probably Stuart is probably the, 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 the most important one just at the moment. And there's, there's two parts to this two, two, four dB scenario, right? Firstly, as we said at the start, it's a component of Clovermax, Legamix DB, Clovix DB plus, all of those. It's Embutone would have been an example of a product, um, you know, where, where it was used in its own, and you might add MCPA or, or other products to it. It is the only Clover safe uh, new lay herbicide that's, that's currently authorized. So it's obviously hugely, hugely important active for us. Typically it's in Clovermax or Legamix DB or any of those. Um, uh, 240 grams per liter of, of the 24DB and 40 grams per liter of, of MCPA. Full application rate there is, is seven liters per hectare. Now, there's kind of two scenarios here. Any product containing 24D that's on farm today, it must be used by October. So when the product goes off registration, distributors have 12 months to, or sorry, have, have um, six months to sell it out. You get it onto your farm before the 31st of October last year, you've 12 months to use it up. So there's, there's a good bit of that, guys, that foresaw that this it was going off registration. They, they bought it last year, they have it on their farm, they have until the 31st of, of October to use that. And that could be any one of those 24DB products, whether it's, you know, Embutone or, or Legamix DB. So that's, that's one scenario. The second scenario then is the emergency use. So like I was saying at the start, you know, products go off, um, are, 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 are not available anymore for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it can be, you know, um, environmental or toxicity reasons. This product is, was taken off the market because the, the company, um, they made a commercial decision and they, they decided not to seek product authorizations in EU member states, okay? It's, it's a commercial decision for, for whatever reason. It is actually approved by the department and there, there are no issues there in terms of product safety or anything like that. So it's a commercial decision, it's important to, to say that. Now, as you said at the very start, Stuart, Clover is hugely important and I had a slide in Farm to Fork there in terms of you know, the, the fertilizer reduction there, 20%. Clover is obviously got a massive, massive role to play in that, okay? So the department and thanks to a few people in Chagas, um, like Sir Michael O'Donovan, looked for the emergency use and it was granted because there were no alternatives of it were available. But there are a few conditions and I suppose we need to, you know, we have this emergency use and it, it is brilliant. So it's very important that we, you know, we are aware of the conditions and we all abide by them. So we have 120 days to use it, uh, to purchase it and use it. And that starts from the 14th of May. So if my calculations are right, that runs out in, on September 10th. Okay. So any farmer can, after the 14th of May, can purchase it and, and then, but must use it up um, by, by September 10th. Uh, you can only buy and use in that period and any unused stock should be returned, okay? So nobody should be left with, with, with some in stock after, after that date. And full traceability is required and that's all the ways from the distributor uh, to the farmer. We know that we have to keep records for under SUD anyway, but you know, full traceability is required. And I don't know if they, I'm assuming there'll be some on inspection somewhere along the line of that to make sure. But you know, look, we're, we're very lucky to get this emergency use and I think it's very important the way by, by the, the conditions of it. Well, I suppose, Kieran, what you're saying there is that uh, if somebody were to have a cross compliance inspection in October, they shouldn't have any Clovermax in their chemical store basically because it should have been returned and that's mm. supposed to be carrying that product. Absolutely, absolutely. So I look, it's all about planning, you know, whatever you're planning to reseed, work out the area, purchase that amount, or, or maybe slightly less than that amount, so you don't end up, look, you don't want to end up with bits of cans left over and, and, and stuff like that. That's expensive to, um, to get rid of after, okay? So look, it's, it's a bit of planning, I suppose, short, really. Yeah. And it, like I said, look, the traceability, just make sure you keep your records up to date on that as well. Like, it's very important. Yeah. So I suppose okay. it's interesting. It's I it was it was actually interesting to find out that it wasn't like I, as I said at the outset. There people probably talked with the department actually pulled the, pro the availability of the product, but it was as you said a commercial decision. I, mm. It's kind of strange in a sense, is it that given given the whole farm to fork strategy, I suppose, and the whole reduction of pesticides. Well, maybe it's it's the reduction in pesticides that's motivating the commercial decision really, but the fact that it's going to be required in 
in, in Ireland, I suppose, isn't driving enough of a demand for those companies, is it? No, and I suppose, look, there, you know, if you're if you're looking at maybe, you know, I think we had a new herbis, our fungicide launched there relatively recently. I think some, you know, around 300 million was cost of, 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 of putting the product it. together. So, you know, they're, they're you know, the, 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 as I say, you have to have a massive market for a product, you know, to justify all the R&D that goes into it. So, you know, I suppose while there are some signals that there may be something coming, you know, at the same time, you know, you, um, you know, you wouldn't want to be depending on it either, you know. Yeah, okay. Um, you're probably going to cover this in a minute, maybe, but uh, from 2022 on, what's the plan and what's going to be the situation? So yeah, it's 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 an excellent uh, it's an excellent question. Um, if you look at something like I, I don't know is the straight answer. Um, if you look at something like Agilox there, that would have been used, you know, that gets an emergency use. It has got an emergency use. I don't know how many years now in a row. So. That's a possibility. It can be applied for no no guarantees that 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 it will happen. You know, so the emergency use is something that may or may not happen down the road. I I, I can't answer it. Uh, there are uh, there is a product in the pipeline, um, but again, you just have to be careful about products in the pipeline whether they will actually come true. Uh, they might be clover safe, but they mightn't control any of the weeds that, you know, we deemed that kind of, you know, the likes of docks and chickweed, obviously, too, that, 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 that we would need to control. So, you know, there are some possibilities down the road, you know, the emergency use or maybe new products coming online. I know that, you know, we are looking at some of the older products as well that might be registered, say, for, for permanent grassland, maybe if maybe some of the other companies might make commercial decisions there to seek registration for reseeds, that's another possibility, you know. So there's, but, there's work going on behind the scenes in relation to that though, I suppose. Is what to, and as you said, there was, there's, there was supposed to be a potential of a new spray coming on the market the coming year, but actually that's possibly going to be delayed a little bit more. It uh, could be the following year at the moment, as, as we kind of currently understand. But again, I, I suppose, uh, you gave Michael the credit there, like so Mike Egan and Deirdre would have been involved in it as well. But I mm. would imagine that if we don't have good alternatives available by next year, that the, the lads are going to apply for that emergency use again for another period in the coming year, I'd say. And given that the, the department don't have an issue with the product, uh, you'd imagine that it should be straightforward enough to get it. But it's not going to be something that they're going to get a five-year derogation on. It's going to have to be a year-by-year -year kind of scenario, yeah. I, I'd imagine. Yeah, that what you're saying makes, I suppose, makes sense, George. Yeah, it's logical in fairness, um, you know. But you, you just never can be sure. There's, there's, you know, both political, commercial. So there's a lot of, a lot of decisions there in the background, you know. <laughs> um, okay. there's just another question, then, Kieran. Uh, this might make more sense to you than it does to me, now, But uh, would, would you recommend stale reseed method as an alternative? That makes, makes sense. Um, stale seed, stale seed bed. Um, from a clover aspect or is it just maybe establishment in general um in general yeah in general i suppose yeah plowing is is probably the most reliable in my opinion you know i think plowing is the most reliable but i appreciate there is number of reasons why you would use maybe direct seeding which would involve a stale seed bed you know you spray stale seed bed for anybody that's not familiar you spray it off with with, with roundup um, you know, you, you wait for everything to die off and you, you can direct drill with maybe a one pass or you can with direct drills or, you know, you, you have another, a lot of options there. There, there are some advantages and certainly, and I'll talk about in a second, in terms of pest control, um, you know, but I think it's a little bit horses for courses, really. Um, there's some land that's, that's maybe quite stony or that as well and doesn't, it's not suitable for ploughing and, and, and that's a, a good option in those scenarios too. But in my own opinion, ploughing is probably the most reliable, you know, the most expensive but the most reliable. Yeah, in terms of um, seed establishment, it's definitely the most effective, I suppose. Yeah, but then I suppose there's also the questions being raised about the, the flush of nitrogen that gets released when you plow and like you're, you're winning on one side and losing on another side. It's kind yeah, of <laughs> I, 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 I think the, in, in, in terms of establishing method, in, in, in my experience, you, you really select the method that, that's suitable for the farm. I, I yeah. The, that would be my, my answer to that question. I don't, I, I, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. Either. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. Fair point. Um, okay, so 
I have two little little bits left, Stuart. I'm just we're okay on time, I think. Yeah, we're fine. Yeah. So um, I'm going to go through herbicides for new lays. So there, there actually isn't a, a lot of change on last year now, as 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 it turns out. And I'll I'll have a final bit just on pests because that all, that always comes up as well. So look, I have a bit of a rhetorical question there. Which doc is easier to control there? Um, there's no marks for for getting the right answer here. You know. <laughs> If you can spray something that's small and actively growing, you know, obviously it's much easier to control than 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 a, you know a dock with all you know with big massive roots that are going down one meter. You have to get the the chemical translocated from the leaves down through that roof. You need root. You need very good uh, growing conditions to to get to succeed in that. So I suppose that's why you know where you have bad dock problems in particular, you know, reseeding where you can spray off that dock there with, with life is it and start afresh. I mean that's 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 key really. So just in terms of you know just a few areas around um, around post emergence weed control really. Um, I just said it there, but look, you know, um, reseeding is the best solution. It's the only solution where you've got long-term weed control problems. You just have no option other than to get in. You know, as I said, seedling weeds are easier to mature or to control over over mature plants. Um, glyphosate's essential. You know, absolutely essential uh, in 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 that scenario, and also very important to. Um, to uh, use the use the correct rate, you know, the max rate for destruction of grassland is six liters per hectare. Again, in my experience, I think you should be up near the near the higher rates there. Um, again, I know there maybe from a grassland context where areas that I wouldn't be very strong on. There, there might be reasons for receding in the autumn over the spring, but from a, a weed control perspective, spring trumps the autumn in my opinion because you get more opportunities. Especially in you know further south you go, receding can can work in late there into the middle of September, and that's fine. But you run out of opportunities to control weeds. Then uh, you're getting into poor weather conditions, and a lot of the herbicides like the phenoxies, which is your two four dBs, MCPAs, they do not work well in cool conditions, and that's a very important thing to remember. So, you know, your the spring reseed opens the door to a lot more uh, weed control opportunities. So, you know, no, no, there might be other reasons, Stuart, why, why people might say, no, autumn suits me better, maybe from grass growth perspective and all of that, and that's another issue. Um, the timing then is, is obviously crucial as well. Look, six to eight weeks after receding, in a kind of a normal situation, but what you're really looking for is, you know, from the clover safe spray perspective, you need that first trifoliate leaf out in the clover. So you need to see a good scattered clover across the field. That'll normally coincide with the grass at two, three, maybe four leaves, that, that sort of stage. And like, you, you, you often get a scenario where, you know, if it goes late, you know, it the, the the you get competition from the grass, and some of the maybe especially like the docks can be a little bit hidden under the grass when the sward gets big, and your control isn't as good. So you know that 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 timing is very very important, and again, that's part of IPM there as well. And look, this can often happen. Don't spray if the, the plant is under stress. Somebody might be receding there today, you know, and and maybe get a bit of rain at the weekend, and it's up and established, and then get a dry spell. You know, we've all seen this, this patchiness, you know, because crops or, or, or grass uh, reseeds are suffering from stress. And like you will damage both the clover and the grass if you're spraying a crop that's that's under stress. So unfortunately, in those situations, you do not have a choice other than to hold off until until a bit of growth comes. And the then only thing the, there, though, Kieran, is it's going to it's going to retard the, the actual establishment as well in one sense. So you know, like if you end up with nine weeks at that stage, but because because there was a dry spell and it hasn't really taken off, it's probably still going to have good control. But I think one of the things that we picked up with Deirdre there the other day is that in general we're very late spraying. Uh, no matter when we do it, even like as you said, the, the autumn scenario, sometimes it doesn't get done at all, obviously, um, it, until the following spring. Uh, and in cases then where like we're probably that bit late at, at, on a, at the farm level compared to like like the example I would have given today we were talking to Deirdre is that uh, what I would see out on farm probably is that people are probably going to get the spray uh, at the stage the lads are grazing it inside in Moor Park like you know so from from your time in Moor Park you know that they, they'd be spraying it very rapidly after as, as quickly as they can basically and they graze it at very low covers whereas and that's also part of IPM as well I suppose the fact that they're grazing it at that lower cover means that they're getting more rapid tillering in the, that reseed which is then creating the competition that you're talking about isn't it 
Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And it's about understanding how the plant grows, you know, uh, apical dominance don't, you know, obviously you, you, you the grazing management after the receding is, is huge, um, you know, and, you know, obviously, ideally, you wouldn't be cutting it, say, for silage would be probably a good example, you know, where you don't give that the grass doesn't get a chance to, to tiller and cover the ground. So you don't get good ground cover, you know, you cut your silage, you have a big open sward and it allows, you know, look, if, if there is space, that allows the opportunity for, for weeds to, um, to, to come through. I think I have a slide in a minute. Tim O'Donovan did a lot of work there a few years ago on, on um, dock control in, in reseeds. Like, and one of the big ones was there, you know, where you did get your docks controlled uh, at the right timing. You got four or five years of pretty much dock, uh, you know, sward free from docks. And the reason for that was that even after that, after the, the, the year one or year two, when the seedling docks um, actually established, when there was even a bit, bit of, uh, you know, a bit of room for them to come through, where you had a dense sward, you know, the, 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 the grass, uh, the chlorophyll in the grass was actually, actually absorbing the UV light. And that was, uh, the, the, that was stopping the dock from, the, the little seedling dock from establishing. So, you know, that, that ground cover is just crucial. And I think it was nearly one of the first things I said in the IPM is, you mm. know, stop poaching, you know, you know, a competitive sward. That's IPM all wrapped up in one, like, you know. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, look, I, I suppose just in terms of target weeds, uh, annual weeds, I said this already, you know, not normally a big target. We can, we can manage those. The exception there is chickweed. Now, chickweed's an annual weed, but it behaves like a, like a perennial weed because it does have its, it, 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 the way it grows, its growth habitat one, but also it, the amount of seeds that it, that it produces. So that's why chickweed is, is, a, is a particular problem. Biennial weeds, rag would be the likes of, of obviously ragworth and, and spear thistle that people would be familiar with. And then perennial weeds, I suppose, these are the, the, these are the difficult ones, docks, creeping, thistle, and buttercups and rushes, they're the they're the big ones. They are, and I think you might have said this already, Stuart. Like from from those that work that was done, you know, one percent in reduction in dry matter yield for each one percent in ground cover by dock. So you know, you, you, there there is a threshold that you reach very quickly where you might have to decide, you know, reseeding is the only option. Um, and that's just that experiment I was talking about there. Um, just looking at the clock there. I, I won't go into massive detail on it, but look, I suppose it, it just emphasised the point of, you know, the importance of the seedling sprays, you know. So you can see the red line there, it's that reseed in autumn 2010. Um, the, the, the chart here shows, the graph here shows up to autumn 14. But I, I, I know from talking to the lads in Kildalton, go back to that plot two years after that again, and those, you know, where those seedling sprays were done, there was still excellent control of docks compared obviously to the untreated or, or where there was mature sprays went on, you know, mature sprays, you're, you're, you're getting control quite often of the top growth and you're not getting control of the, um, the big tap root that we saw there in the first picture. So, you know, you, you, you think you have a great job done and ultimately what happens is you're you know, those, those, that rootstock, you know, reinvigorates and, and you get the problem back again. And the problem there, Kieran, obviously, is that you're going back in with chemistry again then to set to so in subsequent years, whereas the effectiveness of the seedling spray is actually, while people might be saying, yeah, why you're kind of reaching for the chemical very early on in that scenario, maybe it might sound like it's counterintuitive to the whole IPM thing. It's actually mm -hmm. reducing the amount of chemical that's been used in the life of the sward. By doing it that way, absolutely. I mean, if you've got bad docks, you're you're literally in there. You're literally in there every second year, I suppose. Really, you know, um, versus you know, get maybe five or six years out of a reseed. Like so, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, in terms of chemical load, it's obviously um, it's 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 the way to do it. From an and generally, I suppose with the with the um, seedling sprays as well, you're going with lower rates in a lot of cases too. Like you're only maybe going a liter per hectare, or three quarters of a liter per hectare compared with your your standard is generally two litres with the likes of your dock stairs and your pasture tree oil and mature grassland like. Yeah, you're just yeah. reducing the overall chemical load. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I've, I've put together a, a slide here which sort of sums up the... No, I haven't obviously dealt with the, the established grassland, and Stuart, maybe that's a... Excuse me. Yeah, a that's, webinar fair, yeah, right, that's another day, yeah. But yeah. we'll say in terms of for people that are receding at the moment, we do have... Okay, we'll start with Clover Safe. So we do have our Lega Mix DBs. 
and then you know our under clears clovix all of those type ones and i i went through all of that some people have those in stock 31st of october if you're buying clover max um you know you you have until the 10th of september by 14 to may to the 10th of, of, of september um, they will do a very good job on, on the likes of docks. Um, the timing is crucial, you know, most annual annual weeds, it'll, it'll do a good job as well, to be fair. The one weakness there is, um, is chickweed, you know, chickweed will not be controlled very well by, by those. And, and, and chickweed, clo chickweed and clover safe is, is, is a problem, okay? Mm. We had Triad uh, available, Tribenuron there, it's the third option there. When you add that, uh, as far as I know, and I'm pretty sure it's not available at present. Um, so if there is some in stock, the use up is the is the 30th of, of, of June anyway. Now there is, I won't go into the, the full rigmarole of it, but that product will appear on the market fairly soon, I'm told. I think the, the name is Taxi. So that, that, that chickweed option might even be available for the autumn, but as we stand today, that, 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 that triad, you look, if there is some in stock, well and good, but I, I think it might be difficult to get for, for most people, Stuart. So that's just something to keep an eye on, clover safe and, and versus um, uh, chickweed control there. Okay. So again, Kieran, I suppose it's emphasising that, that the reseeds have to be sprayed early with the likes of the clover safe, get in and graze it in to try and take out the, the chickweed that way, probably. Yeah, the, the, the cultural control, obviously, yeah. is very important there. Yeah, 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 you know, um, so that Tribenuron may be available later on, but as I say at the moment, I think you'll find it hard to get it. The, the one above so it there, try, it, try it itself won't be available anymore, you're saying it's going to come on the market under the name Taxi potentially? I think it is, yeah, yeah I think it is, yeah. Okay. yeah that's the plan now, as I say, what'll, what'll happen down the road, we'll see. Yeah. Um, and then the one I didn't mention there is the straight, the embutones there, that's the straight uh, 2, 4 dB, unless you have that in stock, that's, that's, that's the only where you're going to you're going to get that at the minute and then we have the other options which are which are really good you know but you know in terms of weed control but you obviously have the clover issue so the the straight floxipire which is binder hurler reaper all of those people are, are probably very familiar with them at this stage 0.75 it, it it does an excellent job in docks and chickweed and dandelions as well you know so if you're not worried about clover that's a you know a low cost option of getting docks and chickweed you know done that, and and it, and it is very 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 good, and then you have the the two um, uh, products that come from Wheelands there. You've got Envy, you've got Pastor Trio. Okay, so Envy is Floxipire and Frazolam. So you know you're 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 again getting a, a good broad spectrum again good on chickweed and and docks there. But when you add Clopyrolid to Pastor Trio there. You're, you're, you're adding in uh, thistles there as well, you know. So, you know, Pastor Trio would be a very good broad spectrum all around um, there. But, you know, if we, as you say, we have, the, we have the clover issue there. So you're into, into over sowing after that, I suppose, if you, if you want to get, get uh, clover back into the soil in that situation. And then there's issues around that then, uh, Kieran, in terms of periods of time between spraying and actually incorporating the clover, which is kind of yeah it tricky you are no it varies I, I i did a quick search there this morning envy pastor trio is is three months um the label of hurler was the only straight floxipire that, that's a 12 on the label but the other two contain floxipire as well but but three months would be would be what the envy and pastor trio would be there you know so i suppose um, what you're really pointing at there um would be that if you're using the likes of the envy or the pastor trio or their equivalents you're really looking at controlling the weeds this year with a view to maybe on uh, over sowing clover in the coming year. So that's part of the whole plan that Deirdre was talking about, kind of the strategy of how you're going to go about incorporating the clover on, on farm over the next number of years. It's not all about 2021, like. I, it is true. Yeah, it's planning. And I suppose that, that, that remember I mentioned there that like chickweed could be an issue. And if you anticipate chickweed being an issue, that's the route that you might have to take, like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now this is a, um, a a question here. There's a couple of questions there. So, are you finished the slides there, Karen? Yeah, I, I am on that one. No, yeah. I have a section on pest control if if you want. Or it's um... yeah, actually, that's going to be addressing one of the questions. So, just before you move on to that, there, um, how would you rate pasture pack? That's uh, I can't think of a, is a crop link brought that out there last year, or there's some one of the companies. It's it's after putting a, it's it. I can't think of the chemistry that's in it, but um. 
And maybe you're not familiar with it, probably. I am. Uh, I'll come back to you in two seconds. It's 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 a it's a it's one of these, and you'll see a little bit of this more coming uh, down the road. It's uh, one of these twin packs. So yeah. I think one of them is definitely uh, Floxipire anyway. I, I, I might come back to it short just before. Yeah, you. okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, but you will see some of those um, where people will combine two products in, in a box or a pack. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite broad spectrum from, from my memory. It would be for established grassland rather than reseeds. Okay. Uh, so I just look at the clock. I'll make a quick job of this. Look, pests or tree pests really that we need to worry about. Uh, frit fly, and I can I can be quick on this because this is more of an autumn reseed problem than than a spring. So the frit fly produces tree generations during the year. So it's the third generation that generally generally cause a problem. My picture mightn't be brilliant, but what you tend to see, some people call it dead heart. So you walk into the field and you can see the most recently emerged leaf. And if you, if, you, if you just pull it, it just falls out or it's gone yellow against the background of the green leaves around it. So the, the frit fly lays its egg and the larvae feel, feeds in, in, in the center of the stem. And that causes the, um, the, 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 the noose leaf there to die. So you, in effect, it, it, it kills the plant. More of an issue in the autumn. Uh, now, it, it affects Italian more than perennial. As I say, the autumn more than the spring. It does affect, someone mentioned direct drill versus uh, maybe plowing. It would be more of an issue there because you have more, more trash uh, there to, to deal with. So look, the, the control really is you know, if you've had a problem with frit fly before, you know, go to the spring rather than the autumn. If you want to do it in the autumn, another option is leaving a wide gap between, um, between crops is normally a, a good idea. You know, if you can spray off, leave it there for three, four week period, or even if, you know, somebody wants to stick in a brassica crop or something like that, that's, that's an option. There is no chemical control there. Come back to the IPM bit there. Sorry, the, the spray cabinet at the very start that, that, that went a few years ago. Slugs, I apologize, that's, that's barley instead of grass, but anyway, it's the, it's the first picture that came to me this morning. Um, slugs will graze above the ground. So when you're trying to differentiate between slugs and leather jacket, you'll see the leaf shredding, and that's classical uh, sign of slug damage. You can see it on the, on the leaf there um, above the ground. So in terms of, of slugs and risks, they, they do like clover, uh, more so than ryegrass. Um, reseeds are more vulnerable. Uh, slot seeding or direct seeding sometimes can 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 be an issue because slugs will follow the strips. You know, some people call them like motorways for slugs because once they get into a track, they tend to do a bit of damage that way. And you often do see a good bit of slug damage there with with with, with slot seeding. Um, but the big one really is is land or crops on heavy ground. So slugs obviously like to be on heavy ground, cloddy. You know, where there's plenty of spaces between the between the soil particles. Uh, poorly rolled rough seed beds. That's that's where you'll see slugs wet. They're the big issues. Control um, plowing uh, definitely reduces the population. Fine, firm seed bed, you know, well dried out and rolled. Look, they're the, they're the key ones. You can use slug traps to assess numbers. And also you've got the chemical control, which is slug pellets like the aldehyde or, or ferric phosphate there. So there is a chemical control option there. The slug trap then is just your fertilizer bag, is it? Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, it's 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 a use a fertilizer bag, uh, you know, and and put some bait under it. Uh, so something like um, muesli, they, they they like muesli actually, something <laughs> like that. Uh, layers mesh is something that they like as well for some reason. Stuff like that. If you get more than four or five under that, that's a sign that you may have an issue. But you need to do them around the field, not just inside the gap or that. Like you know, you need to get a, I suppose, a good distribution across the field to see the extent. But if you're anticipating a problem, it's a very, very good reason. It's a big IPM measure. Do you know rather than just going out with slug pellets, see if I have I got an issue. Check, put down the traps. Check 24, 48 hours. Count the slugs more than five on average. You know you possibly have an issue there. And then the last one is uh, is leather jacket damage. So the the larvae, obviously, of the of the crane fly or the daddy long legs, more more commonly known. Um, again, the risks here are mainly in 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 the spring. But history is a great guide here as to whether you have a leather jacket problem or not. History repeats itself big style here. 
uh, if you've had a problem in the past in a particular field, there's a strong likelihood that you'll, you'll still have that, that problem. Um, a risk indicator, I suppose, if you see a lot of, of, of crane flies in, in July and August, mild wet autumns then favour the survival of eggs, which we tend to get quite a bit of. And it's in the spring that you actually see the damage. So the, the, the larvae, just when they're before they pupate, uh, say that would normally be in April, May, June, that period. That's tens when you get see the, the, the most damage from, from leather jackets. And the symptoms, slugs, just remember, are over the ground. What you'll find with leather jacket, you'll walk across the field and you'll see individual yellow leaves. Um, and you just pull them with your finger and they'll come away. They'll be nipped just below the surface. That's the, that's the, 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 the sign of leather jacket damage. Control, again, look, plowing during the egg laying, laying period disrupts the life cycle. That's, that's the big one, really. Again, you can put a, a, maybe a brassica uh, crop there in between. Uh, a break, again, the same between destruction and, and, and re-sowing. But the big one, and it's the same, and it's a good way to finish the presentation, high soil fertility. So, you know, you do your reseed, encourage good early plant growth, your pH is right, your fertility is right. You know, that's that the, the, once, once the, the, the grass plant starts to tiller, uh, the stems get a bit too thick and the, the impact that they make at that stage short is, is very little. Yeah, okay, so um, just get, getting it off to the best start possible is yeah. the most Im important piece of it all, really, in terms yeah. of... And that's the big IPM control, really. It's, it's, it's just getting, the, getting the, the, the reseed going, you know, and it will grow away from them. There's only a short period where, where the, the crop is vulnerable, really. Okay, so if you can get a, a really powerful establishment by having everything right in the first place... Like it could get a little checked by leather jacket fruit fly slugs, etc. But it can, it, it, can, it has the power to overcome it at the same time if yeah, it's and establishing well. It does, and just to remember as well, if you anticipate a problem with leather jackets, an autumn reseed. If you anticipate a problem with fruit fly, a spring reseed. Now that's not exactly binary like yeah. that, but it's it's probably you you if you think of the life cycle of both pests, that's 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 where you're going to um, probably get most success. Yeah, very good. Um, I suppose just to come back to the pasture pack thing, I just had a quick look there. It's tendus and trust, actually, is, is what's in that. Okay, okay. So um, you're happy enough with the effectiveness of those things, you'll say. Is that, like that combination product, I suppose, it's just broad spectrum, I suppose, is, is the plan with the, the two different chemicals, really. It is, it? Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it is quite broad spectrum, um, and we'll, we'll cover, like, all the key weeds in, in, in established grass, yeah. Okay, so thanks very much, Karen. I suppose just to summarise it all for, um, I suppose we're obviously in a situation where our chemistry is becoming limited anyway. Um, we've already lost some of the chemistry that has been available to us. Um, so we have an emergency use in relation to Covermax that we can avail of up to the 10th of September. Um, but I suppose the, I, the main thing, I suppose we got Karen on to talk about the chemistry, but the real important piece for people is to be aware of the fact that there's so much going on behind the scenes and that in reality to, to reach, like Kieran, Kieran always gets the phone calls from ourselves in the grassland side when we have the problem and we want him to solve it with a, a chemical, but we should be working to try to avoid that scenario by focusing on soil fertility. And I, people will probably be blue in the face from us talking about this, but it's just underpinning everything, like in terms of grassland performance and but also reseeding establishment, etc. Um, so get a good, really, a really good, strong uh, reseed established. It has greater power to, to kick off and avoid the whole pest issue that you covered there at the end, uh, but also the power to kind of suppress weeds then, which reduces the requirement for the chemical usage in the lifetime of the, of the, the, um, the sward. I suppose, uh, as you said there, we, we might look at uh, coming back to you another day later in the year, maybe about just kind of the, the kind of control in, in general, maybe silage sports, maybe later on in the year, because it's nearly getting too late now to spray um, weeds and silage currently for first cut, just the way the, the year has gone so far. Um, and yeah, sure, look, I suppose it's the, the, that IPM thing isn't probably something that a lot of dairy farmers have been exposed to. It's, it's a lot more common at your side of the house with the tillage guys. Uh, but it's something that we need to be aware of and the buffer zones would be the other thing that I would really emphasize to people as well. So that two meter buffer for the fertilizer, the minimum five meters for slurry and depending on the chemistry that you're using, 
it's going to be anywhere from a metre up to 40 metres, as Kieran pointed out now, that's probably a tillage spray as opposed to a grassland spray in that scenario. But we just need to be very conscious of it. We're very much in the spotlight in terms of everything that we're doing now around water quality, as, as Kieran has said, and that exceedance in relation to MCPA is going to come back to bite us if we're not careful. So we need to be conscious of those, um, of those uh, buffer zones. So Kieran, thanks very much for joining us today. Um, very informative talk. Um, I'm looking. I'm going to push this one out through Twitter tonight that people would have looked back at it. There's great information in it for for dairy farmers and grassland farmers in general. So, uh, and as I said, something probably that we're not going to maybe seek out uh, if we're attending something that we're going to go looking for. But it's something that people need to be very aware of. So thanks very much for joining me this morning. That's all for this week's Let's Talk Dairy webinar series. And don't forget to look out for more bonus episodes each week. I'll be back with our usual Dairy Edge interview on Monday, so do listen in then. I'm Emma Louise Coffey, and thanks for listening.